the House and Senate reach a compromise state budget agreement. Nonviolent felony convictions could be cleared for people who prove they're walking the straight and narrow. And the final touches are placed on a fracking bill. The story's next. Quality public television is made possible through the financial contributions of viewers like you, who invite you to join them in supporting UNC-TV. Hello there, I'm Kelly McCullen. Thanks for having us into your home tonight. Our top story covers a state spending bill that was reached earlier this week. The main event of the 2012 legislative session. Republicans say their budget priorities are better funded than in the 2011 budget, with Democrats saying it's just not enough to reverse last year's cuts. The House and Senate reached a deal on a $20 billion 2012-2013 state budget this week. The budget restores uh, approximately $251 million in recurring spending uh, in uh, K-12 education. Uh, it, uh, it funds the enrollment uh, for the community colleges and the universities as well as uh, the, uh, the K-12 enrollment um, uh, needs. K-12 education funding includes $27 million to launch the Excellent Public Schools Act. That program aims to increase elementary school literacy. A provision that would hold teachers accountable for classroom results was dropped, but local school boards could begin drafting policy to offer merit pay for excellent teaching. Democrats say all these funding numbers, they swirl around, but in the end, the result is less for public education. This budget does not serve the children of our state. Last year's budget damaged education at all levels, and this year's budget worsens those cuts. The compromise budget restores over $200 million in public schools cuts, but past spending reduction levels remain, and schools will still send money back to the state. Budget negotiators reached a deal on teacher pay increases to match a 1.2% increase for other state workers. I don't know what you hear when you go talk to your teachers, but when I go talk to my teachers, they say, yes, we want to raise. We want to raise. We want you to vote for a raise. We, we need a raise. But would you, ha would you have 100 of your colleagues cut in order to get the raise? Uh, they will almost uniformly say that's not what they want. Senator Richard Stevens is what they call a big chair, helped write the budget. Thanks for being on the show. Thank you for having me. First question from the Senate perspective, how do you feel about this spending plan? Well, it's a good budget. Uh, you know, a year ago we passed a two-year budget, and the second year we come back and look at revenues, look at spending, and see if there need to be any adjustments, and we were able to make some. Uh, unfortunately, the situation with Medicaid caused uh, a giant hole in the budget the very first week we were here. We had to spend up all the revenues left over for this current year that ends next week about $200 million for Medicaid, so we started out even. Revenues are going to be about where they, we thought they would be. Spending will be about where we thought it would be, except for some very important areas which we hope we can get to, except Medicaid again. And we had to put an additional $200 plus million into Medicaid to shore that up for next year. That meant we're more limited to do other things that we really wanted to do. So How, as Medicaid grows, and there's a $200 million hole, you're obligated to look somewhere in this state government and find $200 million when things like that happen. Right? Correct. Therefore, we couldn't do some things we'd like to do, but uh, we were able to produce a very sound budget that's balanced. It uses uh, ongoing money for ongoing expenses. And that was a very important principle for the Senate. Uh, it uses uh, monies to shore up our retirement system, our uh, state employees' health system, all the things that have had issues before in the past, those are fully funded. And most importantly, it added dollars for education in this state. Your critics on the education plan are going to say, yeah, you put some money back in there, but you still left a hole, so there'll still be a reduction of services in the public schools. Um, I've heard this pretty much every year I've been down here. What's the situation with the public schools overall? Well, keep in mind, this General Assembly inherited a $2.5, $3 billion deficit just one year ago, uh, and tremendous amounts of cuts had to be done to deal with that. Uh, and we inherited several hundred million dollars of cuts in education at all levels. 
and we've tried to deal with that. And so what we did was, unlike the budget adopted a year ago, which would have reduced school spending at the K-12 level by another $74 million, we didn't do that. Mm -hmm. But in addition, and more importantly, we restored a significant part of the uh, cuts that were made last year to public schools. We can't make it all back up in one year. So there have been a lot of questions about the pay raise scheduling. The, one of the budget versions had guaranteed pay raises for state workers and maybe a pay raise for teachers if the local school board wanted to give that raise. What, what came out of the final budget? The final budget. All teachers will receive a pay raise. All state employees will receive a pay raise. All retirees of uh, te retired teachers and state employees will receive a cost of living adjustment. Uh, employees at the community college system and the university system who are professor rank or instructor rank are eligible for a pay raise as well. Senator Phil Berger is pushing that Excellent Schools Act with the literacy focus or the kids get held back till they can read at grade level. $27 million fully funds it at, at, at right. the end of the day from what I've heard in the press conference, but that money is in this compromise budget. Does the policy go with the money or is the money there in case a policy gets passed in this Senate and House and, and approved? Uh, the latter. You recall the Senate passed uh, the Excellent Public Schools Act. The portions of the act that are funded in the budget are included literally word for word in the budget document. We've already had the policy discussion and debate about it, so that wasn't new, but it's entirely included. So the literacy program is included, uh, the allowance for the start of a performance-based pay system in the future for, for teachers is included. Uh, the grading of schools that people we believe can understand better, ABCD, as opposed to uh, different kinds of words now. Uh, those are very critical, important parts of that legislation are included along with the money. So that's a subtle issue in that's this budget. That's a subtle issue. Pending the governor signing it or just not vetoing this bill and bringing you back in. Correct. Medicaid, well, you, you touched on it. You set aside rainy day money, $100 million just mm -hmm. in case. What happens to that money in case... You don't need it, and Medicaid stays on budget. It stays in the rainy day fund. Several years ago, it was actually 1995, the state of North Carolina established a rainy day fund for the first time and said we ought to have 8% of our budget set aside for natural emergencies, uh, for economic emergencies, so that we'll have cushions for the future. Most states have done that now, by the way. We were one of the first. The fund should be at about a billion six right now, 8% of the general fund. It's down to about 300 million before today's action. This will push it to almost uh, four and a half uh, million dollars. Still not where it should be, but building a cushion for that inevitable time when there will be a natural disaster in this state, we have them every year practically, or another uh, economic downturn. We'll be ready for it. Senator Stevens, thanks a lot. Always good to see you. Budget writers and legislative Republican leaders both admit Medicaid budgeting is tricky. It never seems to be accurate as patient costs spike. GOP leaders guarantee Medicaid another $200 million boost in the budget with a $100 million reserve fund should Medicaid costs unexpectedly soar the next fiscal year. We have actually got a, a good dialogue going with the executive branch. I think everybody recognizes this is a problem where we need to take the politics off the table and just deal with the fundamentals of budgeting. The University of North Carolina system receives $1.4 million in student enrollment growth funding increases. The system will cut $9 million in other places at its discretion. UNC TV funding is reduced by about $750,000 as it's part of the university budget in the state budget bill. Representative Deborah Ross joins us. The Democratic approach to this conference budget. Um, Heard some of the speeches. What's your take? Well, it's a sad budget for North Carolina because it's, we could have moved the state forward in terms of education and job creation, and this budget does exactly the opposite. First of all, there's going to be $190 million less for our K-12 through education throughout the state this year than there was last year. And we had superintendents from all over the state come in and say that we've already cut to the bone. And now they're gonna have to find $190 million additional for cuts. You, if you wanna quantify that, $190 million would pay for 3,400 teachers. Now we don't know that they're going to lay off 3,400 teachers, but that would be, if you were only going to do one kind of cut, that would be a way to go. And we know that there were personnel reductions last time, and there's just very little left to cut. So that's where we left 
K through 12. With the universities, there continued to be discretionary cuts. And over the biennium, more than $400 million has been taken out of our universities. That means fewer classes. It means that we're losing some of our best faculty. Those faculty frequently bring grants. Um, and they've been our signature way to attract business and show that we have a knowledge-based economy. And we're cutting that much out of our universities. We have a spread out there, Representative Ross, to the November election. The Republicans can say we restored funding in education, and more than one reporter, very experienced more than me, mm -hmm. say, boy, it's how you spend the numbers. So what do you think the general public's going to think about this? Well, the general public's going to see it in September. They're going to see the effects of the education budget in September. If you say you're going to cut $500 million, and then you restore $150 million, You've still got a $350 million cut. And so the rubber hits the road in September. And we had the same kind of um, rhetoric going on about, oh, we haven't cut any teachers, but of course we've passed it down to the locals to cut. And people said, oh, yeah, it's rhetoric. Both sides have a point until September came. And when sub September comes and we see the cuts and we see the classes that are not offered at the universities and we see who's been leaving and we see that teachers and teaching assistants and other school personnel have lost their positions or classes are bigger or students don't have textbooks, mm -hmm. then the proof will be in the pudding. Another big headline, a lot of folks are going to get a 1.2% pay raise, it appears. Yes. Um, and teachers as well. Was that enough or is it the right time to give a permanent pay raise? Would a bonus have been better? What would the Democrats have done? Well, I think a pay raise is essential. It's been too long since we've had a pay raise. This is the dynamic with the pay raise. Last year, the state health plan was changed so that now state employees have to make a contribution to their health costs. In the past, they didn't have to do that. And so this pay raise is pretty much going to be eaten up by a lot of the contributions that have to be made. And again, just to quantify it, for a teacher, for your average teacher, the pay raise will amount to between four and $500 a year. But that will be eaten up in Comp paying for health care costs or paying for dependents who are on the health plan. So clearly it isn't enough. But the even sadder thing is that we're giving the survivors this measly pay raise and there are more people who are going to be laid off. And so we need to figure out a way to have the state workforce that we need to guarantee that our children have a good education, good teachers, and enough teachers in the classroom. And for these larger elementary grades, certainly a teaching assistant to help out. And the budgets that we've seen over the last two years have put all of that in jeopardy. And giving somebody four or $500 a year is a good thing. I'm all for it, particularly if it goes into base pay. But it's not going to compensate for the extra work, and it's going to get eaten up by health care costs. And so we need to do right by our state employees. Representative Deborah Ross, thanks for discussing the budget as we head into, I guess, election cycle 2012. Thanks for being on. Happy to be here. Thanks. Speaker of the House Tom Tillis has called on Governor Bev Perdue to sign this budget. He says the alternative is the current state budget plan with its cuts that are more severe than the compromise budget promises. We would ask her to seriously consider the real opportunity to do a lot of positive things with this budget and address some of the things that we've all mutually agreed should be addressed beyond the budget last year. In the absence of that, then the alternative is to go to last year's budget, and I don't think anyone in this chamber thinks that's a good idea. The Senate Rules Committee is investigating how Department of Transportation emails sent to two state senators were edited by Governor Purdue's staff without DOT Chief Operating Officer James Trogdon's authorization, but featuring his digital signature. The mid curratuck Bridge and the Garden Parkway projects will need some state funding beginning in 2014. Republicans say the edited emails appear to say that DOT needed funding in the current budget bill, a change from what they say they were told by General Trogdon himself. Trogdon was on a National Guard training exercise when the emails were written in his name. Purdue administration official Pryor Gibson says this is a simple case of sloppy communication.
The document was originally signed by the Deputy Secretary for me, or was proposed to be signed by her for me. Uh, however, Mr. Gibson stated that it had to come from my signature. Letters were then digitally signed, and Mr. Gibson took four copies that were made. I have apologized to Mr. Trogdon, who I know and respect, um, and the role that my part in this had to, to cause the letter to go out under his signature, that was incorrect. And I'd also like to apologize to, Dep uh, to Deputy Secretary Coward, who I've known and been my friend for more than 20 years. The Senate Rules Committee will revisit its review this Tuesday. The Senate and House send a new energy exploration bill to Governor Bev Perdue's desk. The chambers agree to establish a new state board to craft drilling and fracking policies, set royalty payment rates for landowners, and began a mandated investigation of natural gas deposits throughout North Carolina. This bill does not allow drilling or fracking. Separate legislation would be needed as soon as 2014 to actually begin the energy exploration process. Governor Perdue vetoed a similar bill in 2011. A clean energy transportation bill neared final passage this week. A state task force would determine if it's feasible and if it's desirable to shift some state vehicles onto alternative fuels. Those alternative fuels would also need infrastructure. That would be another state study to be launched. The bill would lead to rules for installing electric vehicle charging stations at state-owned rest stops. This bill sits in the House Transportation Committee. The House voted to close a loophole where people avoiding probation arrest can maintain their government benefits. The bill targets probation violators who are, as they say, on the run. A court order could suspend government benefits until that person is captured or surrenders. Some lawmakers worry that families, especially young children, could suffer over a parent's behavior. The bill heads to the Senate. The House easily approved a new school violence prevention bill this week. It would hold school principals responsible for reporting potentially violent student behavior to law enforcement officials. Any student convicted of cyberbullying a school employee would be reassigned schools if possible. Students could face charges for creating false online identities to post harassing messages online. The Senate holds a House-approved bill to give some nonviolent felons the chance to clear their criminal records. Conservatives both support and oppose Republican Representative Leo Daughtry's proposal, which he says would give people a new chance at life. The General Assembly has weighed the issue of cleansing nonviolent felons' criminal records if they can prove their crime was truly a one-time mistake. Passing a law to make it happen has never been closer than during the 2012 short session. Johnston County Representative Leo Daughtry says his expunction bill would require a felon to live cleanly for 15 years. They also must pay any restitution, that they, any damage they cause because of the wrongdoing. They must have good moral character. They must have two persons send affidavits to the court telling them about their good character. Representative Daughtry's opposition has come mainly from his Republican colleagues. Conservatives say expunging nonviolent felony convictions diminishes the legal standing of citizens who have never committed a serious crime. If the record's expunged, uh, how is that fair to the other people that are out here that have kept the records clean. What does it say to people who obey the laws, don't get felonies, should they be at the same level as people who have sure made some bad decisions? Jackson County Democratic Representative Phil Hare says he supported bills like this one to give some felons a second chance at a clean record. And you can argue one side and then you can argue the other side that some people make mistakes and they clean up their lives and they live that way forever. The House vote this week was 76-39. That's veto proof should that ever be necessary. The bill heads over to the Senate for its final review. The House holds Senate legislation to prevent families from legally surrendering a child and accepting payment for it. This is Senate Bill 910 would ban transactions where the legal surrender of a child's custody is fostered through a trade of cash or anything else of value. Violators would face $10,000 fines and felony charges. 
Lawmakers would also ask the North Carolina Conference of District Attorneys to investigate if a further crackdown would be necessary. A House committee discussed Senate legislation to ban public benefits for illegal or undocumented immigrants. State officials would ask benefits applicants for one of 11 forms of ID. The same officials could face misdemeanor charges if they are caught not reporting immigration violations. The House took action on a bill that would allow community college campuses the option of opting out of a federal college loan program. Governor Perdue had vetoed the House bill back in the 2011 long session, but with the override, the college campus boards can choose not to participate in a specific program called the William Ford Direct Loan Program. Those that opt out would have counselors who can inform students of other tuition assistance programs like Pell Grants, Hope Lifetime Learning Tax Credits. Democrats took to the floor to argue that, in fact, overriding the veto is a bad idea because students need to borrow money. Representative Dale McCormick, you've been on the forefront of this issue with community colleges. Does this necessarily end any loan program at all? And if it does, what does it mean for a student if, indeed, students need to borrow money to pay for the tuition? It doesn't uh, end any programs completely because community colleges always have the option to opt back in if they see that it's necessary. If we had a continued economic down, uh, downturn, we would, if you saw a situation that you had more adults going back to, back to the community colleges for retraining, if what it does is give the board of trustees of each individual community college the authority to make the decision of is it in the best interest of the school and the students at their school. And these trustees of the schools have their heart and soul in these schools. And I, I just think it's up to them to make the decisions what's best for that school. Why would, a, why would state legislators even care whether a college student takes a college loan out to go to, to pay tuition. Wow. You, you've, hit, you, you've really hit the, the essence of it there, Kelly. In the Obama health care plan, the component says that you've got to bundle these together, but you've also converted the risk to the community college. Whereas these had always been handled on the outside, now the school is responsible for writing the loan and servicing the loan. And if the default rates exceed 25% for three years, you lose all funding. Pell Grants, Stafford Loans, all, the, all of your funding. And with some of the schools, you may have only two or three people using these loans. Out of a whole campus, two or three people. Two or three people on some of the campuses, only two or three people. What's the payback rate? Is it, is it greater than 25%? Because that would mean one in every four students would take out a college loan and not keep their word to repay it. Well, and that's just these one types of loans, these unsubsidized are, uh, forward loans. So if you've got only one person is required to put you in the 25% with the rule of small numbers. So if you've got 1,500 kids doing it, you, you, you've got a way to survive. But the Board of Trustees needs to make that decision based on what's best interest of each individual school. Prior to 2010, not every community college offered this loan program. It was a state law was passed by the Democrats that said every college campus should offer the Ford Direct College Loan Program. Is that, is that correct? To my understanding, yes. You've re you just moved that back. This law didn't even last two years before the, the new House majority had passed it to repeal that. And because of the risk involved of losing everything, we just we still have the ability for the community colleges to opt in at a later date to give the community colleges an opportunity to train the people to write the loans, train people to service the loans, but not put all your eggs in one basket and put all the risk out there at one time. If you're a, if you're a community college student or prospective student, it's best with this veto being overridden to check with your local campus to find out what's going to happen. If you think you're going to need these type of loans, you want to check with community colleges that are actively participating. It's, you know, it's not an all in or an all out. Uh, we've tried to let the community college board of trustees make decisions as what's best for the kids in their schools. Representative McCormick, thanks for being on the show. Thank you. The Senate approved some university system projects that are not funded with state money but still require legislative approval. These are projects that are paid for by gifts, grants, and receipts. Some large projects you could see include $40 million to rebuild East Carolina's Belk Residence Hall. UNC Chapel Hill could spend $24 million to upgrade chilled water, steam, and hot water infrastructure. Over at UNC Charlotte, a $50 million investment could be made in campus development. Winston-Salem State's Restore the Core program would kick off with $28 million for new student housing and campus renewal. The Senate honored Sergeant-at-Arms Stan Johnson this week. Sergeant-at-Arms serves legislators during meetings. They guard the doors. They make sure you don't talk during the legislative sessions and so forth. Stan's stepping aside after this legislative session, and he's leaving with North Carolina's highest civilian honor. 
He served the North Carolina Senate for over a decade now, but Stan Johnson says it's time to call it quits. He's worked full time in one career or another for some 70 years, if you count full-time naval service in both the Atlantic and Pacific theaters of World War II. Here in 2012, it's time for that day or two off and a Longleaf Pine Award. I have given uh, several of these Longleaf Pine Awards, the highest award that we give to uh, anyone uh, as far as a civilian in North Carolina. No one has ever deserved this more than you. When most people think 65 or 66 is a great retirement age, Stan has figured 90 would be a good year to finish his honeydew list and not make that daily trip from Hope Mills to Raleigh. I'm going to work around the house and try to go out some with my wife. Did you decide to retire or did your family say it's time for you to retire? I, I decided this. I, it, driving 140, 70 and 70 miles each day for about two years by myself, I decided it's time to, I, 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 my luck might not hold out. And happy retirement to Mr. Johnson. Find us online this week. Our Facebook page is facebook.com slash legweek. We tweet through the show's Twitter name, at NCN Legweek, and our website is unctv.org slash legweek. As always, thank you so much for watching. Quality Public Television is made possible through the financial contributions of viewers like you, who invite you to join them in supporting UNC-TV.